hi to my. Um, nice to be the sole representative from New Zealand. Um, so today I'm here to talk to you about simulation as middle range research. So hopefully this will spark some further discussion. Um, I work in Australia's outback. Um, where I work, we often find um, these. And we're going to click here, we're going to go over. Oh, no, wait. Okay. Um, these are um, clusters of good heat retainer hards and lithic artifacts lying together on the surface. These are ubiquitous in the landscape. It's partly a consequence of an erosion prone yeah. geomorphic setting. When they're recorded, they're often interpreted as campsites. As the archaeologist, how do I go from hards? and stone artifacts to campsites. Well, you didn't see it, but I made a model in my head. In the model, individuals showed up, built a fire, sat around the fire making stone tools. They may have occupied one hearth at a time or several, but regardless of whether or not my model is correct or even sound, the model allows me to provisionally trace causal relationships between an unobservable set of activities in the past and an observed arrangement of objects in the present. This model in my head explains how the patterns in the present may have formed. How would we know if our models in our head are better than any other? One way to improve a model is to subject it to tests. But testing in archaeology is difficult not least because the process of interest involve human subjects in long spans of time. We cannot hang up advertisements at the university recruiting students to go wandering around the Australian desert in order to establish whether or not they would build campsites. <laughs> Instead, historical disciplines often turn to analogous systems to make their inferences. These inferences are dependent on the assumption that the properties of those analogous systems are uniform across time and space. That is to say, any inference about the past based on a model must be prefaced by saying, if the world behaves like my model, and that's a big if the world ex behaves like my model, then I should expect this, this, and this. I think it's fair to say that many simulating archaeologists employ computational models to overcome the barrier of being unable to observe or experiment with processes that may have occurred in the past which is much the same reason that middle range studies and other formation research makes use of ethnographic analogy and actualistic studies. Differences certainly exist between earlier middle range approaches and more recent conceptualizations of archaeology as model-based science, but many of these are arguably superficial when compared to the obvious similarities. Specifically, the language adopted by model-based archaeological studies is primarily experimental aimed at generating a better understanding of variability in the outcomes of historical processes. This is achieved through exploring alternative causal mechanisms and comparing them in a common framework. In a 2014 paper on trends in archaeological simulation, Lake describes a number of successful applications of, to archaeological problems emphasizing sociocultural evolution and human environment interactions with model outcomes that are frequently expressed in social, demographic, or biophysical terms. Some applications, while in the pursuit of explaining higher order social and ecological organization, may assume an unproblematic relationship, or I think I heard linear relationship, between model outcomes and recorded archaeological residues. At the same time, ongoing debates over the interpretation of observed archaeological signatures illustrate that the relationship between past human systems and the material record is not always straightforward. So what do we say? Do we say that models of long-term sociocultural evolution need to be grounded in specific depositional outcomes as a rule? I don't think so. Insisting on this would achieve little and ignore important lessons from the discipline's history. My point is only that the level from which archaeological inferences are drawn, that is the formation of the deposit, has seen far less theoretical attention from archaeological simulators when compared with the development of social and ecological theories. But as long as our phenomena are archaeological, that is composed of material objects from which we infer historical processes, our theories must on some level be formational. What are the benefits to modeling from a formational perspective? 
In my own research, I've found that grounding models and formational logic can suggest tests of the existing archaeological record that can be used to discern between competing explanations. Even when models cannot be readily distinguished by a given archaeological pattern, the formational mechanics made explicit in the model may indicate additional patterning which can overcome this. Agent-based models and other simulations are valuable for exploring the emergent properties of a system through the interaction of individual system components, as Steph, Steph just demonstrated. This seems as well suited to studying complex archaeological formation as it is for studying complex sociocultural interactions. What I think requires careful consideration is that the level of abstraction in our models is appropriate to both the resolution of the data and the generality of the question. Thank you. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, the objective is, as, as Rosella was saying at the, at the beginning, um, if, we, if we really want to, I, I think that the idea that if explanation is, is, is not something we want to do, then we don't need simulation, right? Simulation should be aimed at, 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 um, at trying to explain. And I think in the same way, you know, exploratory data analysis works in the sense that these are all ways of making explicit those models in our head, right? But I think that um, when we are doing archaeology and when we're doing simulations of archaeological processes, we're oftentimes so caught up in modeling the sociocultural evolution, because the, model, the, the, the modeling tools are very good for exploring these types of phenomena, they oftentimes lose sight of the fact that it's actually the pattern in the archaeological record that we're trying to explain. That's a good accusation. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if I heard you right, but I'll take a note at the same time, but um, you mentioned the linear relationships are, are uh, unproblematic for No, I, I, I disagree. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, so, yeah. So no. Sorry. Why? Why do, uh, do I think, oh, if you're, so, I think uh, when the, the discussion was in the context, uh, the, the mention of linear relationships was made in the context of formational properties and particularly taphonomic properties. And one of the things that I found, particularly in my research, is that processes of formation, which also include the processes of inscription, the actual laying down of the archaeological materials, is not necessarily a linear function. It's not necessarily something, and oftentimes this is, this is actually, I think, the, the meat of the problem is that oftentimes when, archaeolo when archaeological models deal with the formation of the record, oftentimes a lot of processes, particularly post-depositional processes, are modeled usually as a linear decay function. That's, that's usually relegated to a linear decay function. And I think that what that does is I think that mistreats the fundamental focus of archaeology, which is the material culture. And if we abandon that, if we abandon that, then what we're left with is models that are not able to explain the phenomena directly. Can I just very quickly explain the difference between linear and nonlinear relationship? Please. Are there any osteologists here? Like human bones, people. Yeah. Anyways, so if they were, they would tell you that there is a there is a very strong linear relationship between your height and your weight. So the higher you are, you are the heavier you will be. Except for if you live in the Western world where there's so much food that you can be this tiny and super heavy, and this is non-linear. So that's what I mean. Like where this kind of what if in the normal situation, this is a very simple thing. The height correlates linearly, you know, you know, you, you kind of draw it on the graph and it's just line going like this. So if you're two meters high, you're also going to be heavier than somebody that's one meter, 50, 50 centimeters. However, if you are in a, in a more complex system where there's too much food, you know, it can be all over the place. So, so you cannot just say, oh yeah, so you're 
one meter fifty high, high, so you should weigh say fifty two kilograms because it doesn't count. It, it doesn't work like that anymore. So that's the nonlinearity, and that's why it's difficult to use the very standard techniques to kind of capture that because yeah, it doesn't correlate so easily, and that's what nonlinearity is in a very simple example. Any questions? Any comments? Anyone has anything to say about middle range? So, um, God, Binford is dead. I know. <laughs> it's like All right then. So that was a lot of theories to start with. I think we're kind of past the stage in the modeling process where we say, oh, should I actually do a simulation? Now we're going to look at how to do your simulation.